many times when we're thinking about the future, somewhere in the thinking of our minds along those lines, we will think about our own death. And as you get older, I suppose you do that more and more, but in actuality, no matter how young or old you are, death is just one heartbeat away, and you never know when that might happen. As a Christian, one who is of Christ, by obedience to the gospel, living faithful, one doesn't uh, worry over those things. By worry, I mean take thought about that which you can do absolutely nothing about. But you concern yourself with whatever time you have left of being faithful to the Lord as the New Testament teaches. And we do that in the midst of a very perverse generation that goes further from God and His Word and their perspective in lives every day. But I suggest to you that while most people think about the day of their death, if they think about it much at all, the Bible focuses beyond death. And you'll find stated by the Hebrews writer in Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die. Then he said, After this the judgment. The judgment as pictured in the scriptures is not a time to where you stand before God and he decides at that moment whether you're going to be saved or lost based on how you lived here. You get to the judgment of God either saved from your sins and having lived faithful to Him, or you get there as a lost person. One who has never obeyed the gospel or one who did but fell away, apostatized, ceased to live according to the teachings of God. Sometimes people will say, well, we're all headed for the same place, usually to dismiss any kind of discussion of the Bible to determine whether they're believing really like the Bible said and living like the Bible teaches. Well, I can agree with them from this standpoint. Yes, we're all headed for the judgment. Everybody's headed for the judgment. It seems to me that we need to know that the judgment is the place where the sentence is meted out. Because you get there lost or saved, then that sentence is meted out on the basis of how you live this life. God is a perfectly just God. He knows all that the object of knowledge. He knows everything we've ever thought, said, or done, or what we should have done and didn't. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, the Holy Spirit-inspired writer wrote these words, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But then he said, what is in verse 14? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Surely it would make a difference to all of us if we would realize that once we are dead or we've gone through the process of dying and the spirit leaves the body, that that's not the end of all things relative to how we lived on this earth and what it means to our eternal destiny. Then we must be sentenced from the throne of God according to the way we lived here on earth. That means rewards and punishments because God's a perfectly just God. You know, at times we schedule appointments and later we wish we hadn't <laughs> or possibly we just don't want to keep them and sometimes we can postpone them or we can actually cancel them but this appointment you cannot postpone and you cannot cancel and it comes after you've gone through the physical process of dying it is the judgment of God. Now, there are a lot of questions I find in my mind after all these years of studying the Bible concerning the judgment of God. 
and I know we never can answer them, but we have sufficient material regarding the same to give us what God intended for us to have to help us better serve Him here and be prepared for that day. I don't know when it's going to take place. I know exactly, I don't know exactly what it will be like to go through it, how God will do it. I never let those things bother me. They don't take up any time in my mind. I get concerned about, though, what the Bible does say about it. Thus, those things that the Bible teaches about the judgment of God, that we can know, I, I want to know them and understand them and get out of them all I can because they will help me be better in my service to God. So we need to understand that we stand self-condemned whenever we practice those things we condemn in others. That's just simply called hypocrisy, pretending to be something you know you're not when it comes to serving God. Paul dealt with that in Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. Also in our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, as we call it, he warned against hypocritical judgment of others. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 5. It, it's a sad thing, but it's a true thing. We are oftentimes much, much better at seeing the sin in the lives of others than we are recognizing our own personal sins. That's one reason I think we find in the Scripture so much said about having an honest and good heart and that we examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. That we don't hold others to a standard of living that we don't hold ourselves to. And that we are steadfast and consistent in the application of those truths to our own lives first and then in dealing with others. Remember when Paul wrote or was talking to actually the Ephesian elders he had called to Miletus as he was headed for Jerusalem. He made it clear that they were to begin with themselves. And then oversee the flock as the Bible teaches. Well, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, as a preacher of the gospel, you need to think about yourself first and what you're doing. Paul said of himself that he buffeted his body and brought it into subjection, lest after having preached to others, he himself was a castaway. So here's one thing that will condemn people that will cause God to say through Christ, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, is if we are hypocritical in our lives. We need to know that God judges according to his standard of truth and not mine. Remember John 12, 48, where Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And that again is brought out by Paul to the church at Rome in Romans 2 and verse 2. We're simply not going to be judged according to the ways or opinions of men, whether they be in the church or out. We're going to be judged according to the truth. There will be no bias, there will be no prejudice, there will be no respecter of persons. These are always dangers to every one of us. When it comes to our families, we really don't want to deal with them sometimes like we deal with other people's families. When it comes to people that are our friends, we don't want to deal with them sometimes quite like we do those we don't like. Or that are just actually our enemies. Well, it's amazing when you read through the gospel accounts and how Jesus dealt with everybody he was the same with everybody just notice sometimes he he was the same with everybody whatever you did that was wrong he dealt with it as it was wrong it didn't make any difference was Peter or whether the Pharisees people that did right and all that depends upon the divine standard he used to measure right and wrong then he dealt with them accordingly. Well, we're members, if we're Christians, of the spiritual body of Christ. We're of God's family. We're Christians, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Should we not look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Should we not look to him as the way that we use our powers of discernment? I think we should, and we have no better example than him or the teaching of the New Testament whereby to do so. Remember, it was Jesus who prayed 
concerning the unity of the apostles and those who would believe on him through the apostles' word. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Now that works if I think about myself. If I am to be set apart from the ways of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, am I, if I am to view this world as a place to get ready for eternity, then I'm going to have to realize personally that I am sanctified by the Word of God. I'm set apart. A saint was a member of the church. It meant simply he does not or she does not live as the world lives. The member of the church, a true saint, who's faithful to God, lives as the New Testament teaches. We need to remember that God's goodness does not indicate an approval of sin. I think some people have said, well, you know, this has been going on all these hundreds and thousands of years. He hasn't brought us into judgment yet, so it must not be that he's going to do so. That kind of reasoning was even used by some when the New Testament was being written by saying, since the Lord has not returned as he promised, then it must mean that he's not going to return. Well, they were looking at things from our limited, finite standpoint. We're bound by time and space and we're in a material thing. But Peter pointed out that a day with the Lord is a thousand is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. In other words, he's not bound by what we're bound by. He has no beginning or ending. And we need to understand that very fact when time continues on. And Paul dealt with that too, and I keep referring to Romans. But you might read that sometime in Romans 2 in verse 4 just to see how he emphasized that. Because just the fact that we may temporarily escape the consequences of our sin does not in and of itself indicate that God approves of that sin. But he has appointed a day in the which Paul said he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained in that he has given assurance and in that he's raised him from the dead. That's what Paul told those pagans on Mars Hill in Acts 17. And of course, he immediately said in Acts 17.30, or said that even before verse 31 that I just quoted, repent. In other words, because that fact, repent, as surely as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead to save us, as surely in fact as Christ went through all he did go through to save us from our sins, demonstrating the love of God for us, culminating in his resurrection from the dead, then, then we must be just as sure that there will be a day of reckoning for all of us, which we will be sentenced to heaven or hell according to the way that we live this life. God's long-suffering. And the older I get, the more grateful I am. And I know we all need to be long-suffering. You know, God's long-suffering, but He doesn't compromise His Word in being long-suffering. What it means, He suffers long with man because man is expected to find God's truth that saves him. But it doesn't have a thing to do with compromising the truth. He's trying, at looking at it from a human being, to give man more and more time to come to repentance. Second Peter 3 and verse 9. He wants all men to be saved. Christ died for all men. But somewhere out there, all this present system of things will cease. And we'll all be caused to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We need to know that God will judge all men according to how we live. Our actions, our works, Romans 2, 6 and 8. Now, we always urge people to hear the gospel and humbly obey it from an honest heart. And order their lives, the rest of their lives, faithful to God as the New Testament teaches in the church. Thus, when you stand before Jesus, you'll stand before Him as a Christian. One who has faithfully served the Lord. And thus you'll be judged according to your works. But what works are they? Well, if you live a faithful life, there'll be the works that have to do with serving God. There'll be the works of obedience. Well, does that mean then that you will be flawless? 
Never having made a mistake as a child of God? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Because the system that God has ordained to save us is the system of salvation through grace by an obedient faith. So to get into that state of grace, one must be obedient to the gospel. That Paul tells us is the power of God to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. And that's why you find on the day of Pentecost where the Lord's church was established that they were added to the church. Well, that's the place where God's favor that we don't deserve is bestowed upon all people. So when a person dies in the faith in a state of grace, a Christian in all the Bible defines that to mean that he will stand before, she will stand before the judgment bar of Christ to give account of the deeds done in the body on the basis of the favored state. If you're not one of the favored of God when you stand before the Lord in judgment, then you have to be one of those who's unfavored, and that means lost forevermore in a devil's hell. People don't want to think about that. It's disrupting. It causes thoughts you'd rather not think. But they're good for us if we let them impact us as they ought to to cause us to be more determined to make sure that what we believe is acceptable to God. And that what we do is truly authorized by God. So when you look at James 2, verses 24 through 26, you remember that James is writing to members of the church, to Christians, when he talks about faith without works is dead, being alone. So we need to know that in the church there are works that Christians do. There are things God's enjoined upon the church to do that has to do with being faithful to the Lord. And God expects us to do them. We're obligated to do them or we're not faithful to Him. And we'll give an account of those things someday, whether good or bad. So we're going to be judged according to how we've lived, 2 Timothy 3.10 and 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. There are a lot of folks that believe a doctrine that says, well, mentally I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. I know I can't save myself, and I know that I've sinned, and that separated me from God. So I just resolve in my mind for Jesus to come to my life, and then I just pretty much go right on doing, well, not too much sin, but pretty much living as I want to. Well, you can't find that in your Bible. And you say, well, I don't know about that. Well, I can tell you how you can find out. You can study that Bible and understand it, for that's the reason God gave it to you. It's so you could know His will. But as a free moral agent and having intellectual powers and rational ability, he expects me to demonstrate to him that I want to know, that I want to learn the truth. So then Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 31 and 32. That's the reason that there's so much talked about in our Lord's earthly ministry concerning our disposition of mind or our attitude or our mindset toward God and godly things. If our attitudes aren't right, then we're not apt to spend much time in the study of the Bible. We won't care too much about what the Bible teaches. We'll go ahead and do whatever it is that we do love. But for those who love the Lord, Jesus said plainly, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. American Standard Version, John 14, 15. There's never been any greater proof of my love for God than to do what he said. There is no greater evidence of your faith in God and Christ and the gospel system than to render obedience to the will of Jesus Christ. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now, he wasn't getting on to them, as we might say, for calling him Lord. He was getting on to them because they acknowledged he's Lord, but they wouldn't do what you would do in following the Lord. He's Lord, you comply with His will. Why call Him Lord and not comply with His will? God's going to judge without respect to persons, Revelation 2.11. Someone has said that death is the great equalizer. Well, I know the judgment is the great leveler. We every day read about presidents and prime ministers and other kinds of heads of state and very wealthy people and very famous people in Hollywood or on television and all such things as that. You know, none of that will make a bit of difference on the Day of Judgment. Not one bit of difference. We'll all be on the same playing field. 
Whether or not a man has enjoyed the benefits of material wealth, even if it's earned as honestly as it could be earned, or an education that may have educated him to benefit a whole host of people in our society, or even holding some kind because of accomplishments of special place in society up the ladder of ways, it won't make any difference. All will be equal before God on that judgment day. It's always amazing then when you think about one of the tools of the devil is the pride of life or the vainglory of life. And people want to accomplish this. I want to do, make some big splash in the water. I want my name known. Well, I want my name known by God as a person who loved and kept his commandments. Nothing else matters. It just doesn't. Not a thing in the world matters. You may be not known by anybody. Some of those the Lord picked in his earthly ministry. For example, the widow who gave her two mites, and that was all she had. Who was she? Anybody else take note of her? Christ did. And so he teaches all of us. There may be somebody that um, you never heard of in the church. But the Lord said, He that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. And they may go about quietly, faithful to the Lord, studying their Bible, worshiping, being ready into every good work, trying to help the sick. I remember one lady that was a dear lady to us when our children were actually still being born. Sister Effie Huddleston. You know, Jody, sometimes it's good to go back and remember them. And she would, Jody would be home with babies. In those days, we had babies everywhere you looked. <laughs> so she would go out with me when I would go, because she was, I don't know, 75 years old. And I was probably, what, 26, maybe. But she would go out with me to study with somebody, so somebody would be with me. And she knew her Bible. And she would sit there beside me while I did the teaching. And she knew where we were going by the subject we were discussing. And she'd be handing me scripture references. As I, I, almost, you know, I had my walking outline right there. I'd just reach and get it, and she'd have it ready for me. She was a dear person, and she'd had a very hard life. I don't know that many people ever heard of Effie Huddleston. You wouldn't have if I hadn't been with her and heard of her, and I said her name. But as far as my mortal mind knows, she was one of those that went about quietly doing what she was supposed to. There are a lot of people like that. We hear big name preachers and they get popular. There's nothing wrong with having a great ability to preach the truth as long as you live uprightly as you preach it. And to fight error, all of that. And I know that's done as it ought to be. But what about the people who can't preach that well, who don't do too well in teaching? Can they not go to heaven? Can they not serve God? Read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And look at how many people were picked who were not well-known people. In fact, even among the apostles, you have them named in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But when you get into the book of Acts and you get past Peter and John and James, brother of John who was slain with the sword, and you get to Paul, what were the others doing? You don't read that much about them. But they were doing what Jesus commissioned them to do, to be apostles and accomplish the work the apostles had to do. But we don't read about them. Can't you just see one of them, maybe if it was possible for such to be as we do as humans, looking at all of this and say, well, why did Paul get to write 14 books of the New Testament? And I didn't get to write one. That's the way people think. I'm an apostle just as big as he is. And I can just see Peter saying, look, I was following the Lord in his earthly ministry and I took direct correction from him when I sinned and I preached the gospel on the day of Pentecost and I was the one God selected to go to the household of Cornelius, the first uncircumcised Gentile convert and preach to him and uh, there at Galatia I make a little mistake I'll put that in quotes, little mistake and you come up and jump on me that's the way people describe it, because he had to withstand him in the face because he played the hypocrite. Now, that's the way we think. And that same kind of thing caused all sorts of problems in families, on the job, at church. 
because we think not the words of the truth. And yet all that's going to be brought into the judgment. We need to know then that God will judge through Jesus Christ, Romans 2.16. Now, why is that the case? Because Jesus is as much man as you are and I am, but he's as much God as God is. He's lived and been tempted in every point like as we are. He knows what it's like to live on this earth as we live on it. And thus it's that one of the Godhead three who became a man that will judge us having understanding of what it is to serve God here in the midst of all of this where the devil dominates and is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. But 2 Corinthians 5.10 said we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, I'm looking for mercy on that day. What are you looking for? Pure justice? But I can't find that mercy on that day if I don't love the truth supremely now and have my old sins remitted by believing in Christ, repenting of my sins, confessing my faith in the Christ as the Son of God, and obeying Him by being baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. The Lord then, upon my baptism, adds me to the church. The realm of favor, the realm of grace, the realm of faith, and obedient faith. I want to stand before the judgment bar of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, with a merciful Savior presiding and looking at me as one who back down here on earth heard the gospel and obeyed it and did my best to live according to His word, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. Now I can expect mercy from that merciful judge. But coming before him, having spurned the gospel, having never heard it, having never used life to find the truth, and to know what all the Bible says he did for me, I could never do for myself. And the love manifested from the Father through Jesus Christ and his own giving up of the form of deity and taking upon himself the form of a man to be tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, to know where his life was going to end and how it would end before he ever came upon cruel Calvary's cross and anguish and shame. To know all of that was done for me and then there is a stand before him in judgment having never given any thought to obeying him or when things got moving a little too tough for me, I just threw up my hands and quit. Do you think I can expect mercy from him when he's done so much? That's why we're taught in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. Pointless, useless. Where? In the Lord. That's why you have in Ephesians 1, 3, that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. But well, one of those spiritual blessings is to be able to know you have the mercy of Christ. That when you come before Him, having been covered by the blood of Christ from the time you were baptized to the time you died, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Present tense verbs there in Greek means keeps on cleansing. As I am faithful and walk in the light as He is in the light. To be able to stand before Him, knowing I'm covered by the blood of Christ, is to stand before Him to be able to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. So when I think of the fact that I must die, if the Lord doesn't come back first, and then there's the judgment, then let me go to that judgment, having named Him here as the Son of God, and in repentance and belief obeyed the gospel and being baptized into him and lived according to the truth of God. Ordered my life accordingly. And let me never grumble or complain at the things that God's enjoined upon me through the, that's my duty through the New Testament. Because everything there is for my good and to keep me from the evil one. Everything. You think of the worship this morning. Every act of worship directed to God in spirit and in truth. Not only glorifies God, but keeps us from the evil one. It's a part of the process. 
So God's ordained a system, the gospel system, where if I believe and obey it and continue in it, I will be kept from the evil one. And if you could picture in your mind the devil standing over here and you're coming up as a faithful child of God before the judgment bar and he starts listing all these things you did that was wrong. And Jesus turns to him and says, but he humbled himself, believed and obeyed the gospel and lived faithful to me. And there's no wrong attributed to him. Not laid to his charge. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the joy that we have in the Lord. And when you read of the Ethiopian eunuch rising to the water of the grave of baptism and going on his way, it said he went on his way rejoicing. That's something to rejoice over. And we don't think of these things enough. But let us so live our lives that when we seriously contemplate and think about the judgment of God, that will motivate us to teach the lost more about Christ to teach the gospel, to use every opportunity so they won't have to stand before God in the judgment and hear, depart from me, I never knew you, and everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. What a horrible thought. Remember the inspired words of the Apostle Paul. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5.11 Daddy used to have, as I close, when I would get a little boy especially, and I'd whine or whatever it was I was doing that kids do from time to time. He would look at me real pitiful. He'd hold out his hand like this. He'd say, come cry in Daddy's hand. Now that was so saying, shut up. You ain't got anything to cry about. What are you whimpering about? And that's the way we are as children. Remember, we're children of God. Sometimes we whimper. Sometimes we complain. Well, we above all people, if we're faithful to the Lord, have nothing to complain about. We get into it with one another, just like kids in a family sometimes do. But why? I can tell you basically why. I want my way. Let me remind you of your own upbringing and then your own children if you have them. When children get into it in the home, or when you as a child got into it with your siblings, I buddy didn't have to worry about that. He's the only child. <laughs> and Burnell helped him on that all the way through. <laughs> you realize that when, when that happens, look at the squabbles, and most of the time it's because somebody didn't get their way. Let, just think about kids, first and five. Somebody did something to me they shouldn't have done, or at least that's my view. They may have been defending themselves from me, but when the story gets told, then, of course, it's their fault. Well, then all that kind of thing can happen among the children of God because you just didn't treat me right. Well, any time all that happens, just remember how the Lord was treating so gently on the cross of Calvary when they drove those nails in his hands and feet, and remember as he suffered there, it was for no sins he did, but he suffered for you and for me. That can make a great deal of difference in how we get along in our families, even how you get along with yourself and how you get along with everybody else. If you're not a child of God, we studied a moment ago the plan of salvation as to how to become a Christian so you can be ready to meet your maker. If you're a child of God and have sinned, then repentance is necessary, a turning from that sin or sins. Confession of those sins and prayer to God for forgiveness. But the great and wonderful thing is, this is always wonderful as a gospel preacher. God stands ready to forgive. And if you'll do your part, He will forgive. And we can all go before the judgment bar of God, hearing Christ say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. You're subject to the blessed invitation of Christ. We invite you to come while we stand and sing. <laughs>